Okay, so we're in First Peter, and one of the reasons Liz gave the, uh, you know, the little story about government is that's part of the text we're going to look at uh, today in First Peter. Uh, but before we get to that, I want to uh, uh, show a little video. Uh, don't worry about the sound. Uh, there will be a, a, a guy at first talking with a Scottish accent that you won't be able to understand anyway. So, but anyway, don't worry about the sound. Just uh, enjoy. Like I said, you wouldn't understand it anyway, so. You might wonder, you know, how long were they going to keep doing that? It was the same thing over and over again, and, you know, I might have, you know, I probably could have ended that video, you know, a minute sooner. But that's the point of what they were doing, to do it over and over and over again, because they are, they are training their bodies to always make the same move so that it becomes automatic. I mean, this is any kind of sports training, musical training or training in all sorts of areas, part of what you have to do is do it over and over again because what you are doing is you are wiring it into your body so that you just do it automatically, especially if you're really, really tired and you're stressed. You've got to train your body to react a certain way. And so those young guys are just doing it over and over and over again so that they don't even have to think about it. This becomes an automatic move, an automatic response. Okay, so it's, it's built into their flesh. Okay, or now with, you know, people studying the brain, it, it, their, their brain is being wired in a certain way. It's affecting their brain so that they just, they just do that and no longer does anyone have to say, this is what you need to do. They just do it. They just do the move over and over again. <clears throat> and in a moment, you're going to see why, you know, you know, why I showed that and why I'm emphasizing the importance of repetition, of practice, and the importance of rewiring our brain and rewiring our flesh to react in a certain way. In 1 Peter, we're coming now to a big turning point in the flow of 1 Peter. And these two verses in chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, are or basically the transition between the first part of the book and then the, the rest of the book, pretty much. So here, Peter says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles. This is the third time that uh, Peter has used that reference to them being foreigners or exiles or resident aliens. These are related words and kind of are related to the, the length of time you're there. Okay, so for instance, those of you who are students here in Riga, you know, some of you are, you know, you're, you're here for several years because you're getting a degree, okay? Some of you, you're just Erasmus students. You know, you're here for a few months, okay? You're here for the same purpose for different lengths of times, and that's the two words that Peter is using there, foreigners and exiles. You know, you're living in a place for some length of time, but it's not your true home, 
But he says, abstain from fleshly desires which wage war against your soul and keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. And that word, we're going to come back to the word honor. So that when they speak against you as evildoers, you know, because you're a little bit weird, you're a little bit odd, you're Christians, you don't completely fit into your culture. You know, so they're, when they speak against you because you're different, they actually, when they see your good works, will glorify God on the day of visitation. Now, if you're paying attention, you can see in those verses this flow that we've talked about several times. The flow of 1 Peter, you are different, so be different so that you can make a difference in the world. You are different. You are foreigners and exiles. Okay? So be different. Abstain from fleshly desires and keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that, so that you can make a difference in the world. So when they see your behavior, when they're inclined to speak against you, actually, ultimately, they will glorify God, recognizing that your behavior was actually honorable. So this is the flow, this is the flow of 1 Peter. And here, Peter is transitioning between mainly focusing on you are different, so be different, um, and then a lot of the rest of the book is what is it going to look like to be different? But all the way through there is going to kind of sprinkle out these statements about so you can make a difference. Already last week in the text that Nenad was preaching from, you know, we saw that you are holy, you are special people so that you can proclaim the excellencies of God. You are this so you can make a difference in the world. In a few weeks we're going to look at the section on... Um, Husbands and wives, I've been nervous about that text, you know, for months, you know, knowing that was going to come up. Um, but, but there, Peter talks about behave this way so that as your husband see your good works, it will make a difference. Okay. So the, you know, the entire book of 1 Peter is kind of organized around this flow. The book as a whole and pieces of it have the same kind of structure. And so here, Peter, again, is transitioning from the first part with the emphasis on you are different and beginning to introduce what it means to be different. Uh, and then we have here the statement about so you can make a difference in the world. Now, what Peter goes on to do is to talk, apply this in very specific areas of their, their life as exiles, as foreigners, in their land. And so today, in a few minutes, we're going to look at, you know, what it means to be citizens in the state. You know, wherever you live, you've got a government. What does it mean, you know, it, for your lifestyle? How do you be a Christian and a citizen at the same time? Next week, what, what is that going to look like is your life as workers? I mean, there Peter is talking to slaves or servants. I don't think any of you are slaves like people back then might have been, but we can apply that as we think of our life as workers, as we have bosses, we have people we are accountable to. Uh, and then as members of a family, you know, husbands and wives, and then more generally as citizens in your society, just, to, you know, in the marketplace with your neighbors. You know, what does it look like to, you know, to be this kind of special person, to be holy, to belong to God, but at the same time living, living here in the midst of this society that we live in. We've also talked about, you know, being positively odd, kind of our short form of talking about this. To be different, you are different, but it should be a positive thing. And actually this phrase, positively odd, I think can be very, very helpful as we even try to interpret these. Um, by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about, uh, you know, how many of you have been reading 1 Peter? And how's that going? Have you, you know, have you gained any insight so far in your own reading of 1 Peter? Anything cool coming up? Several wives are very weird. Okay. <laughs> you, did you say wives are very weird or about wives are very weird? About wives are very weird. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's, like I said, you know, that's, that's uh, a more scary text, you know. And, and let me tell you, by the way, 
when you're standing up here and preaching that, and you know, you, you see like Veneta, you know, and you know, my wife and so forth, it's kind of scary to, to preach that. But we'll get to that, okay? <laughs> oh man, that's even, that's, that, oh my goodness. That, that will be positively odd, but, uh, but this phrase, positively odd, actually can help us to, you know, to, to interpret and sort out, okay? Because for all of these different areas of life, you know, what you should ask yourself is, what is, what is the norm? How do those relationships usually work? And then what, what would be odd? And what would be positively odd? So when we get to, for instance, the members of a family, what... How do those relationships normally work? You know, how did they normally work back then, 2,000 years ago? What did it look like? What was the norm? And what is the positively odd suggestion that Peter is making? You know, so what's the norm, and what would it look like to be different? And when you, you know, I mean, honestly, think about it. Whatever you do tomorrow, whether you go to school, you go to work, just ask yourself, how do things usually work here? How do relationships usually work? How do people usually operate? How do people usually drive their cars? And then ask yourself, what would be positively odd? How can I be a little bit different in such a way that it actually has a positive effect you know, in my surroundings? So in any case, this is what's coming up and we'll come back to this, this image of being positively odd, being different, a little bit weird, but in a way that attracts people. So that people are thinking and maybe even asking you, you know, what's up with you? Why, do you, why are you different? And, and, and they might even think, I, I kind of wish I had what you had. Positively odd. So we can make a difference in the world. So that's what's coming up. Um, uh, and today especially we're going to talk a little bit about as being citizens in a state. But the main thing I want to talk about is, is back to the first verse that we were looking at in verse 11. Um, um, and Paul or Peter says, you know, abstain from, and a lot of translations translate those words a little bit differently. So sinful desires, fleshly lusts, passions of the flesh, or worldly desires, or all ways that different translations in English have translated, you know, what Peter wrote in Greek. Yeah. And so the question is, what, what is it that Peter is getting at? What is he saying we need to abstain from? What is it that needs to be changed? And there's some problems with some of those particular translations. Uh, so for instance, you know, the word like lust or passions of the flesh, we often think of that as being just a reference to some kind of sexual sin, you know, and so all Peter is saying there is kind of keep your sex life in order. Okay. But that's not all Peter has in mind. I mean, certainly that also needs to be kept in order. Okay, but the word lust maybe suggests a certain category of sin that is probably not exactly what Peter has in mind. Um, the, world, the term worldly desires, I think, locates the problem in a completely wrong place. I mean, certainly the world, the flesh, and the devil, these are all enemies, and the world is an enemy. But Peter, I think, is getting at another area of focus that we need to, to think about as we are seeking to live a different kind of life in this world. And certainly the desires Peter talks about, you know, can be sinful, and often are sinful, but Peter doesn't even actually use the word sinful, okay? A good translation that, uh, you know, a real, really good commentary uses is natural impulses. Abstain from your natural impulses. What does he mean by that? What are our natural impulses, and, and what, why is this a problem? <clears throat> Two of the translations up there you see has the word flesh, and that, that actually comes from uh, the Greek word that Peter uses. In the New Testament, one word for the body is the word soma, the, which, which is the body. 
It's a neutral word. It's okay to have a body, to have a soma. All of us have that. God created that. It's a good thing. You know, I mean, the Greeks were maybe thinking, you know, physical body bad, spirit is good, but the, the biblical perspective is God created us as whole people, body, soul, and spirit, and our body is important to what God is doing. There's nothing wrong with having a body, okay? It's good that you have a body, you know? I mean, I wouldn't even know you were here if you didn't have a body, so, you know, the body is okay. There's nothing wrong with having a body. That's a neutral or positive term. But another term that is used in the New Testament, um, in 1 Peter, it's the adjective form, sarkikos, fleshly, or from the word sarx or flesh. And that's a little bit of a harder term to pin down in the New Testament. It's not the same as just your physical body. It often has other nuances, sometimes neutral, uh, but, but often it can have a more negative kind of connotation, okay, because our flesh can get us into trouble. The problem here isn't the world. The problem here isn't the devil. It's, it's what is wired into our flesh that leads us very quickly to do the wrong thing. It's our natural impulses that get wired into our body. And this is true of, of all sorts of areas of our life. I mean, all sorts of things that we do become automatic responses. Okay, and so that's why I showed that video of the sports thing. That was, you know, that the trainer was, was really trying to put that action into their flesh. Okay, so they didn't have to think about it. They're not standing there, oh, I've got the ball. Now what do I need to do next? Oh, I need to pass it this way. And oh, what do I need to do next? Oh, yeah, I need to run. Okay, it's too late. You know, when you're on the, the field playing the game, you don't have time to think about it. You know, so there's lots of actions that have to be trained into our flesh. And this, this happens all the time. I mean, here's a simple example. Um, uh, Brendan, our son, is now a working man, actually an army man, so he's, he's making some money, actually. I think he's richer than, than, than we are, but okay. So Brendan bought a car, okay? And so sometimes, it's kind of nice, I think I drive Brendan's car more than, than he does, um, but here's what happens, okay? Because we have the car that we normally drive, and, and Vasma often drives that car, um, but, you know, each car is a little bit different, so our car and Brendan's car, the gas pedal is a little bit different. Brendan's car is a little bit stiffer, okay? And the clutch is a little bit different, okay? And so when I switch cars after, for instance, there, there's a week where I, I drove Brendan's car several times, and just driving it a few times, the clutch and the gas pedal just became automatic, how I did it, how, how firmly to push it, and how slowly to take the clutch out. And, and within a week, a few times of driving, that how to do that became part of my flesh. It was automatic. I didn't think about what do I do with the clutch and, and, and the gas pedal. And then when I drove our car again, the gas pedal and the clutch was a little bit different. I was like a new driver. You know, I was like doing really stupid things and popping the clutch too quickly, and I couldn't get the gas pedal right because, because my body had been trained in one car, and I had to be retrained for the other car. This is just how our bodies work. Okay, and this is why in any area of life you, you practice, you do the same thing over and over again. Years ago, when I was a kid, um, because I have a musical family, I'm not musical, but I come from a musical family, you know, I thought I should play an instrument, and for some reason I, I chose to play a trombone. Okay, um, so that was like, you know, third or fourth grade. Uh, I was learning to play the, uh, the trombone. The problem is I never practiced, okay? I mean, really, I just, <laughs> I never practiced. And so, you know, the band, the school band, and oh my goodness, you know, school bands, you know, that's like misery. Um, it's better in Latvia than in, in America. But, I, you know, I, I was terrible. I often, I didn't even make any sound because I had to see the note, okay, what, what note is that? And, you know, the slide on the trombone, which, which, where does it go? And, 
you know, and by the time I figured out what that note was supposed to be, you know, we were four or five notes, you know, down the road, so to speak. See, that the, the action was never drilled into my body. It never became an automatic response. It wasn't in my flesh. It wasn't a natural impulse. And what Peter is getting at here is that we, we have certain natural impulses that are wired into our brain, into our body, and, and often those are what are going to lead us astray. And those are what we need to watch. I, I mentioned a few weeks ago, um, I mean, every Sunday when you arrive here early, it's just kind of interesting in this building because we have to get the keys downstairs and, you know, it's kind of a, I mean, it's an old-timey building and it's sort of an old-timey system, and there's always this discussion about getting the keys. And I, I already shared this, but a few weeks ago, I was there and asking for the keys, and, and, and the lady was like, I don't know who you are. I mean, that's what she said. And like I said, I'm having this conversation in Latvian anyway, so that's right, raising the stress levels. And, and I'm trying to say, I, I've been here every week. You know, and she's still looking at me, I don't know who you are. And then I'm like, okay, I'm the pastor, I don't know who you are. But here's the point, my, my natural impulse was starting to get angry. This was just natural. Okay? It was wired into my body. My natural impulse was protect myself, get what I want, get my rights, get respect. I'm the pastor. That was natural impulse. That was my flesh. Now, I, I, I don't know, I'm not, I don't know if I actually sinned at that moment. I might have just, you know, come, went close to the brink of sinning and not quite. But, but my point is, I was, it was, it was getting there, and I, I was very, you know, I was this close to a sinful reaction with her because that was my natural impulse. And, and you know, this is, uh, for me, I'm actually doing better driving in the car, but I, I mean, it used to be you get in the car, my natural impulse is it's going to be a war now. I'm going to drive down this street, and, you know, these Latvian drivers, it's just going to be a battle. I've got to fight for my rights, and I'm not going to let him pass me. You know, and I've, you know, I've, I've shaken my fingers at people that this finger, not other fingers. <laughs> Seriously. Okay, but, but, but that's, that's just what comes. It's natural. It just, it, it's automatic that I'm defensive and protecting myself. It's my flesh. It's, it's wired into my flesh. That's where our bad behavior often resides. We don't even think about it. It's not like we consciously choose sin. Okay, that's, that's why the, the, the translation sinful desires might not be best. I'm not consciously thinking, let's see, I have a choice between sinning or doing right. What do I want to do? I think this time I'm going to sin. That, we don't go through that process most of the time. Okay? I mean, I think I'm right here. We, we, we get into trouble because we just automatically respond in certain ways. And this, this word flesh that, 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 that Peter uses is that it's, that the problem is that our, you know, our, our flesh is born in a particular kind of world that is filled with sin. Okay, and so mo many of our natural reactions, our natural impulses are wrong because it's just how everything around us is that way. You know, we're, we're, we're born with a nature that is bent towards selfishness. You know, I mean, a baby to survive, it's got to demand its own rights. I need food. I need food. Okay? It's just the baby has to do that, but it get, gets wired in. You know, a baby does that naturally, and we just keep doing that, and we're adults, and we often act like babies. I demand this. I need this. Wah, wah, I need this. Okay? It's in our flesh, and, and this is what I think Peter is getting at here. We have to rewire our flesh, rewire our brain. So this is what I want to encourage us to do, you know, this week, kind of one of the applications of this sermon, is just as you go through this week, think about your natural impulses. Just in all the different situations, think about how did I just, what was natural? I just did something. What, 
where did that come from? You know, monitor your natural reactions to all sorts of different things that happen. If you have kids, what is your natural impulse with your kids? With your husband and wife, how do you just naturally respond to one another? Just monitor that and try to figure that out. You know, when you go to work, things happen. There's some frustration. Your boss is angry at you. What is your natural impulse? Figure out what that is. Then ask yourself, is that okay? Or do I need to do something intentional to rewire that? Do I need to train my flesh differently so that my natural impulse will lead me to be the kind of person that I want to be? So Peter is simply implying here, I think, that our our natural impulses are likely to lead us down the wrong road. If they're not trained, if they're just natural and untrained, those impulses are going to just be participating in this sinful world and this this flesh that is affected by sin. So anyway, that's our task for this week, or one of our tasks, to just pay attention to who we are and how we act naturally, and then analyze that a little bit, then try to figure out, what is there something I need to intentionally do differently to retrain myself? Um, this week, this is one of the little pictures that showed up on Facebook um, from a good person, a good Christian girl, actually. Some of you are friends with the person who posted this on Facebook, you know. So she's a very good person, I'm sure. She's one of those, for me, one of those Facebook friends that I don't actually know personally. I'm not sure how we ended up being Facebook friends, but that's it's another weird part of contemporary life. But this is what she said. Don't think too much. Just do what makes you happy. Of course, this is a very common sentiment that you see all the time. I mean, this is certainly 95% of the Disney films. You know, this is the advice. Don't think too much. Just do what makes you happy. If you are wired well, that might work for you. But for most of us, that's going to be a very dangerous way to live. Do whatever makes you happy. Whatever happiness you gain is going to be very short-lived. So what Peter says is those responses, those impulses, generally wage war against your soul. They are not actually going to help you to be who you want to be, certainly not who God wants you to be, the person you really want to be. When you really think soberly, the person you want to be, your natural impulses, whatever makes you happy, isn't going to get you there. You're not going to get there unless you give up some of the things that make you happy. You give up. You retrain some of those natural impulses. That's the only way you're going to get where you want to be. It's obviously true of any kind of sport, It's obviously true of any kind of musical instrument. It's obviously true of almost any skill that you have. You know, I I don't want my doctors to not think too much. Do whatever makes you happy. Go ahead and take a scalpel to my chest. I don't want that. So this is what Peter is saying. That's going to, that philosophy can wage war against your soul, the real you, the real one you want to be, especially who God wants you to be, the one who can experience this. Our natural impulses will not naturally get us there. We've got to do something different. Natural impulses are against our best interests, so they need to be retrained. Okay, so those verses 11 and 12 in 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, and Peter transitions into these more practical things, and we're going to look at the next one that Peter talks about, but we're going to see it, it actually, the two parts of this sermon are actually going to relate, so you need to be patient with me, I hope. So then here, Peter goes on to the first of this 
different examples of, of applying, you know, how to be different in the different areas of our life. And he starts with our life as citizens uh, in, in, in a country, in some kind of a nation. So here, Peter says, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it's to the emperor, supreme, or to governor sent by him to punish those who do evil, to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, by, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Your good works should ultimately make a difference. Be different so that you can make a difference. So he says, live as people who are free, because in God's sight you are free, but actually don't use your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but live as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. <clears throat> now there's lots of things that could be talked about that, and we could probably give a, you know, a couple hours of thinking and talking about the place of government, and we could look at Romans chapter 13. We're not going to do all of that here, but I, I mean, minimally, we should probably keep in mind that, that even a bad government is better than no government. So government really is a gift from God. You know, total anarchy, total chaos is generally good for no one. So it's a gift of God that he has provided for humans, and he always has since the beginning of humanity. He's provided for human government. It's a good thing. Life would be a lot worse without a government. And so however much you might complain about your government, you know, um, just remind yourself, it, at least we have it, you know. At least there's some kind of a system. You know, that's, in most places and times, that's a good thing. Even for these people in the Roman Empire, it was better than complete chaos. Better the Roman emperor than total anarchy where no one is safe, okay? So there's a necessity for government, especially for them. Now, at the time Peter is writing this, uh, the Christians in these, these provinces that Peter addresses this letter to are, are under pressure from people in their society. It does not yet seem to be official government-sanctioned persecution. That's going to come you know, within a few decades, but that hasn't happened yet. It doesn't seem like it. It's just more, there's enough Christians in these cities that people don't like it, so they're facing that kind of sort of persecution and pressure. And, and part of what Peter is saying here is that actually for these people, you know, the government that has a law might be their solution. You know, the, the, the government might be on their side you know, so don't antagonize your government if you're going to need your government to provide some form of justice for you. So that's part of probably what Peter is saying here. Be very careful in relationships with your government, you know, because you might need the policemen to protect you. So don't make those guys angry if you can help it. <clears throat> now, Part of the problem that, that, that Liz was kind of getting at in, in, in her introduction is, you know, how do we apply these texts that were written 2,000 years ago to our own time with very different forms of government? I mean, here, Peter's going to use the word honor, honor the emperor, honor your government, you know, uh, which might imply, you know, don't insult, you know, the governing people, you know, but what about you know, criticizing your government. In a democracy, can we criticize our government? Well, maybe, you know, maybe that's part of the system. That's what, that's what a democracy needs to operate is for the people to raise their voice and say, this is bad, okay? So this, you know, Peter's writing in a different day and time. We have to do some hard work about how to apply this in our own day-to-day -day time. Um, but anyway, I'm not going to try to answer that question today uh, because I don't have time. And number two, I don't know if I have a good answer either. <clears throat> but one of the things that's interesting here is what Peter says in verse 16. 
Live as people who are free, but not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but live as servants of God. And there's a, there's a tension there, and it's a mindset that's kind of hard to, hard to grasp, but, but we can actually find examples in the Bible of people who did this. I mean, those phrases, strangers and aliens, are used elsewhere in the Bible. For instance, it's used of Abraham. And the writer of Hebrews says that Abraham was living in the promised land. It was given to Abraham by God. It was, you know, it was, it was for him and his descendants. And Abraham knew that, but the writer of Hebrews says, nevertheless, he lived as a stranger and alien. And he interacted with the other powers that were around him in a very respectful and honorable way. He didn't go around saying, by the way, this is my land. God gave it to me, and you guys need to do it my way. He didn't do that. He was actually very respectful. And when his wife died and, and you know, he wanted a place to bury her, he paid money for a burial site. He didn't say, this is really my land, and so I can bury her. He didn't do that. He chose to live as a stranger and alien. Even though it was, in a sense, his land, he developed a different kind of mindset. Those words stranger and alien is, is used in, in the book of Psalms in the New Testament translation, or in the Greek translation of the Old Testament for David, King David. And David says, I was a stranger and alien in my, this land. The king, the king said, I'm actually an alien here. I mean, it's just it's fascinating the mindset that, that even David was able to have. He's king. He's anointed by God to be king over these people, but he realized this, I'm not as important as I think I am. I, too, have a God above me, and he's the one I submit to, and we all have to submit to him. It's a different kind of mindset. So Peter is saying, yeah, you guys are free, but actually you're servants of God, and because you are servants of God, therefore submit to your human rulers. Don't lord it over them. You guys are going to hell one day, and you know, I, you, you don't do that. Talk to them in an honorable, respectful way because you're submitting to God. <clears throat> Peter had said, keep your lives honorable among the Gentiles, and here he says, honor everyone, Love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. These four quick, short statements that uh, I think have been, been arranged in a very intentional and important way. One way you can kind of think about these four statements is divide it um, in half, and so the first two, honor everyone, love the, I say Christian family, a lot of translations say brotherhood. You could say, you know, love, love the church, but the family word, I think, is, is needed. It's love your fellow Christian. Yeah, love everyone, but actually, the, you know, there, there should be a unique relationship with your fellow Christian, your Christian family, because they are family. And you know how this works in a family. Okay, I'm supposed to love everyone, but, you know, I, I mean, it should be obvious, and I don't feel guilty, you know, because I love my wife in a way that I don't love other people. And I don't feel guilty that I love my kids in a way I don't love other people. I love all of you, okay? I mean, I hope I do. I want to, okay? But I, I'm not going to love you the same way I love my kids, Okay, because they're, 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 that's a special kind of relationship. And Peter is saying that's, you know, your Christian family. It should be a special kind of, love your neighbors yourself, love everyone, love your enemies, yes, but special kind of relationship with your family. So the first two are, you know, to, um, to those on the same kind of plane or level, and then God and emperor, your relationship to those who are above you. Okay, so that's one way to kind of think through these four statements, but I'm personally am convinced that it's a, it's a more interesting and intentional sort of structure that Peter uses here, an A-B-B-A structure. 
where the first and the last relate to one another and the two internal ones relate to one another. And this is a structure that you find often in the New Testament. I've, in the past, I've pointed out some of these examples of this kind of structure that sometimes might be there just for artistic purposes. But I think here, this structure communicates a meaning and it helps us to sort out what's, what's going on. <clears throat> Mainly here, in, in this section of 1 Peter, Peter's concentrating on the outsiders. The first and last line. Okay, the government, those are outsiders of the family of the church. You know, your, your bosses, your master, probably not a Christian. Those are people outside of your community. How do you relate to those outsiders? When we get to the section on husbands and wives, more than likely that's the situation Peter is talking about. What, you know, when, when you're a Christian but your husband or wife is not a Christian, how do you relate to a husband who is an outsider? That's what Peter is talking about. Okay, so, so here, you know, the, the, in this structure, honor everyone, honor the emperor, those are the outside of the structure. And Peter is focusing on your relationship to outsiders. But there's also the insiders, your Christian family, and of course, God, fearing God. And in my mind, this is a very, very helpful insight about how we begin to rewire our brain and rewire our body. Because what I'm trying to get at here is our natural impulses, especially with outsiders can be very negative. Certainly with government can be very negative. You know, I mean, I, I, I imagine if almost any kind of politician walked in here, you know, I could read on your faces, you know, what you're, what you're thinking. You know, our natural impulse is uh, one of those crooks kind of, you know. <clears throat> your boss, you know, the, you go to the Moxima and the lady who's checking out with the frown and that, that kind of thing. Our, our Natural impulse with outsiders can often be negative. How can we retrain ourselves? How can we retrain our flesh? And what I want to suggest is part of the function of the insiders of this is we, we need to practice here. I mean, there's lots of different reasons to come to church. You know, I realize it's typical for a pastor to say, come to church, come, come to church. And, you know, I, I've actually tried to be fairly relaxed about that because I know sometimes you just, if you need a Sunday morning off, okay, I'm not going to put guilt on you. Still, obviously, I think the church is a pretty important thing and a good thing. And one of the things the church can do for us, I mean, this gathering, I don't mean an institution, I mean the people, is that here we can practice we can practice better impulses. You know, with that woman downstairs, my natural impulse was protect myself, demand my rights. I never have that natural impulse here with you. you know, I don't, I'm not saying I don't ever get a little tense or angry, but that's, that's generally not a natural impulse. I, you know, on Sunday morning, I just naturally expect to smile and to get smiles, to have a good say hello, how are you doing, and all, I, I, you know, my natural impulse on Sunday morning here is usually pretty good, okay? Maybe it's wired into my flesh. It doesn't mean I'm a good person necessarily. It's just wired into my flesh. I mean, man, I've been going to church all my life. You know, hopefully I've learned something. But I practice that here. I practice a better way of relating to people. I practice submission to God. Submission isn't easy to anyone. Who wants to submit? I mean, that's why there's that husband-wife tension. Who wants to submit to anyone? Who wants to submit to your boss? We don't want to submit. We all want to be the boss. That's not natural to just submit. We practice with God. With God, we realize our place. With God, we practice, yeah, I'm not actually up there. I'm down here, and we practice that. 
so when we go out from here, we can better practice submission to people who are above us. And so this is what I want us to do, just among many reasons that you come here, practice. Retrain ourselves. Do the drill over and over again. And you come on Sunday and you just, I'm going to actually talk to someone. I'm very shy, you know, you might be thinking, and I get that, but I'm just, I'm going to talk to someone. I'll just go, I'm going to go up to that person and say, hello, I'm so-and-so. Where are you from? I'm just going to do it. Just do it. You can do it. You can actually do it here. You're completely safe. It's not even odd. Okay, there's nothing strange here to go up to a stranger and introduce yourself. That's just completely natural for you to do that. So in a few minutes, we're going to be done here. Just go do that. Okay, practice that. Because it might be harder out there. Okay, it might be harder out there. So practice here. Okay, maybe, you, maybe this week you're not going to introduce yourself to a stranger. Okay, that's okay. For the next month, every Sunday morning, practice. Practice here. Okay, train, train, drill it into your flesh. Okay. And then you can begin to go out there and do it. Okay. We can do this. We can actually retrain our flesh. All of you have done this in areas of your life. All of you have done it. You've trained yourself in certain areas. All of you have amazing gifts. Whatever it might be, you know, with your hands, music, with your mind, you have gifts. You've trained your mind, you know, to learn things. I mean, some of you, I think of you guys, you've trained yourselves in, in languages, Greek and Hebrew. You, you, you've done that training You've done it in other areas of your life. We can train ourselves to be godly. We can actually do what Peter says here. If we pay attention to our natural impulses, see what they are, ask ourselves, is that really who I want to be? Is that, you know, is that impulse going to lead me the right path or is that impulse going to be potentially dangerous? How can I rewire myself, train myself, so that eventually the responses are good, and they can be. You can train yourself to automatically do the right thing. Okay, it takes a long time. Okay, I'm not quite there yet in a lot of areas of my life. Okay. But Peter seems to think it's possible for us to do that. So there's our task. You've got a task for, you know, we'll, we're going to sing one more song. And then we'll be out of here in a few minutes. So you've got a task for the next 30 minutes. Okay, do a little bit of training with one another. And you've got a task for this week. Okay, just monitor your natural impulses. Just see, what, how do I usually react to things? Spend a few minutes just analyze that. Is that okay? Is that going to lead me the right path? What might I need to change? How can I rewire my mind and my body so that I will be different so that I can make a difference in the world so that First Peter can be a real living book in our life. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for Peter's word. I thank you that you, you helped him to write this letter and that he, uh, with your spirit, uh, chose words and ideas well that can still communicate to us. And I pray, Lord, that we would take his words to heart, these 2,000-year-old words that can still be alive to us, and I pray that they will become living words this week. And I pray that your word would make a difference in our lives, that we would know who we are, who you have called us to be, that we will learn to be different, to be positively odd. And I pray that you would give us the joy of seeing how we can make a difference in the world. Thank you for this amazing calling that you've given to us. Amen.